Hello, everyone. Just want to give it a few minutes for anyone else to join us. One thing I want you all to know, there's a Q&A box um, in the Zoom module. So if you have any questions throughout today's presentation, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A box. I'll be keeping an eye on it as we go through. Um, and then at the end of today's session, I'll be sure to check it to make sure all of the questions were answered. So please do not hesitate to ask any questions. Let me go ahead and get my slides pulled up here as well. And then we'll get started in less than a minute. All right, hopefully you all can see my scene or see my screen. <laughs> Hi, Allison. All right, let's go ahead and dive on in. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me for today's workshop from blank pages to a writing machine. Just a reminder, if you have not looked into the module yet, there will be some great resources in there. You have a workbook that you can download, and then you also have a couple of free outlines for nonfiction books and fiction books to help you along the way. So this workshop was really created for specifically first-time writers, those who have been thinking about writing a book and just haven't yet, or maybe they've started and stopped, started and stopped. I mean, that is a cycle that's so easy to fall in and one that I was stuck in for many, many years. So this workshop was created to give you the tools and strategies and motivation to finally, finally write that first book. I think of my slides. So <laughs> this, uh, this is a common screen, right? <laughs> For many of us, we sit down to write and it's a blank page. How many of you have looked at this over and over again, thinking, how am I going to fill this up? When you first look at writing a book, it feels like a massive mountain. There are so many aspects and so many like words and sentences and paragraphs, right, that form the book. And you think, how in the world am I going to do this? And it's so easy to get distracted. I mean, I know I have carved out that time to write. And next thing I know, I'm getting sucked into social media or doing other things because the blank page just feels incredibly, incredibly overwhelming. And really the secret to all of this, it's just, it's one word at a time, right? It's like anything we do in life. It's putting one foot in front of the other to get to the destination. And with a book, there's no difference. Every time you write one word, it leads to the next and the next and the next. Anytime you have one idea that you start fleshing out and writing, that's what leads to the next and the next. And that's how the entire book is created. Now, I'm going to give you some more specific structures than that to work with today, but really to simplify it all, that's how easy it is. Truly, that is how easy it is. So before we really get into this, I want to talk about what the agenda will be over the next three days. So hopefully you all can join us um, throughout the next three days or, you know, at different points as your schedule allows. But today we're really gonna be focused on the foundational pieces of writing your book. So identifying your why, having a very clear and concise theme to build the entire book around, planning and plotting your book so that you know exactly what you need to complete the book. It's like really creating a roadmap for your book. What are the different points that you need to reach in order to reach the destination? Um, day two is all about goal setting and time management. One of the biggest struggles that come up when people set out to write their books, something that I know a lot of my clients struggle with. 
And we're really going to look at different ways to feel inspired and how once you have that momentum, how to never let it go so that you can actually finish your book. Sometimes starting is easy, right? But that finishing piece, that that is the hardest. And day three, we're really going to look at what does it mean to become an author? What does it mean to own that as part of your identity? How do you then get your book out into the world? And how do you get it into the hands of the readers? Plus, we are going to have two guest speakers join us on day three. Um, they are two published authors who actually took this workshop when I first launched it about two and a half years ago. It's the first time I ran this workshop. And um, so Julie Navickas and Jennifer Hobbs, they're both going to join us and talk about what their journey have been like. Um, and really cool fact, Julie's release date is actually today for this book. <laughs> so it's really neat that we're having this first day of the workshop the same time as her release date um, when she first took this workshop two and a half years ago to finally get that light, uh, that, that fire lit under her to write and finish her book. And she has a full trilogy now, which is really exciting. So if you aren't familiar with me yet, um, I am Lauren Eckhart. I'm the CEO and founder of Burning Soul Collective. I'm also an award-winning best-selling author and ghostwriter. And I'm a mama to those two little boys in the picture. Um, as of today, they're four and six. And thank God they are turning into book nerds like their mama. <laughs> so I'm really grateful for that. Um, I started Burning Soul Collective in 2020. And really my focus was on helping first-time writers with the confidence that they need to publish a book despite all of the chaos in their life, right? It's so easy to get busy. Um, and for me, I knew since I was six years old, I wanted to be a, an author someday. That was my dream. That was everything to me. But it took me almost three decades to finally reach that dream. And we're going to talk about the reason why a little bit later and what shifted within me and the tools that I implemented to make it happen. But I know what it's like to constantly put off that dream and to not pursue it and get caught up in other things in life that, yes, are equally as important. But when you have something that big that you know is not only important to your life, but important to that impact you want to make or the legacy you want to leave behind or the influence you want to have on loved ones, it's so important to prioritize it and really take the right steps to bring that book to life. So that is my passion with what we do here is helping people write their books despite the crazy chaos of their life. <laughs> um, so Burning Soul Collective as a whole, we're fueled by passionate creatives and authors who are using their stories, words, and talent to change the world. Um, we're really about diving in deep and looking at our life journeys and how can we pull the stories from our experience, our unique individual experiences, and pour those into the stories we tell, whether nonfiction where in many times the veil is completely pulled back on your life journey and you're sharing what you've encountered with other people in order to, you know, inspire, empower, or help them. Or if they're buried and hidden in fiction books, right? Even the fiction books are reflective of the lives that we've lived. And, it, and when we own our life journeys and we really look at how we were transformed and how we were impacted by different characters or experiences in our life, it makes us stronger writers, better authors that are able to write powerful books that connect with our readers. Drink some water. My voice is already getting dry. My throat's already getting dry. So I have three main takeaways from this workshop. I mean, there's a lot that I want you to take away from this. <laughs> so I want you to feel very, very confident in everything. But the three primary are, number one, I want you to understand that your author journey is going to be completely different than anyone else's. I see that comparison game come up way too often, and it's what holds people back. Don't try to follow someone else's path. You have to understand that every single author has all of these different, has different end goals, uh, aspirations, desires, obstacles, 
different genres that we're working in. There are so many variables that change one author's path from another. Maybe one person has simply dreamed about seeing their book in a bookstore, whereas another person truly wants to transform lives. Maybe one person wants to make a lot of money and another just wants to use the book to jumpstart their business. Every goal is different and every market is different. Like someone who writes romance is going to take a different approach from someone who takes or who writes thrillers. Everyone's motivations and writing styles, writing strengths, everything is different. So you cannot compare your journey to someone else. The point of learning about writing is to be able to take that information and choose what applies to you and what's authentic to you and adopt it as your own, shaping it as needed. And that's the core of what we teach. Like our central offer is our soulful author journey program. And it's walking people through how do you write, publish, and promote a book. And so we give you all of the information in that program. But the goal is to make it your own so that it fits your particular journey. Because it doesn't work if everyone just tries to do the same thing. It doesn't work then. The second thing that I want you to take away is creative clarity. I mean, by the end of this workshop, I want you to have a better idea of your specific creative flow and preferences as well as clarity on why you are writing this book and the central message of what your book is. Each of our minds, I mean, we're, we're stimulated and motivated by different approaches to input and output of information and ideas. So again, it's all about finding what works best for you. So you can be more determined to write, motivated when you don't feel like it, because those times are always going to happen. And that you can better overcome things like writer's block and main, maintain that momentum from beginning to end to write and complete your book, to publish it and get it into the hands of readers. So it's about developing a personalized plan that's based on you and no one else. So I'm going to give you some options throughout this workshop of things that you can play around with and apply. But the neat part is, is that you're also going to have other options. Like if something doesn't work for you, you can try something else. And so I'm going to give you a lot of different techniques to put into motion. And the third thing I want you to gain is confidence. I mean, that is a game changer. Confidence that you can actually write this book, finish it, and publish it exactly as you envision to. I want you to feel what it's like to be on the other side of this. Having your books, right? Like Jennifer and Julie, who will be joining us. Having your book, being able to hold it, knowing that your dream came, came true. I mean, that's one of my favorite parts of working with authors. I grabbed like a stack here of some of the authors that we've worked with over the past couple of years and their published books. And every time I order one of their books, it's just so exciting to be able to hold it because you know that's the way they're feeling too. It's the way I feel with my books. There's so much that gets poured into it. And when it's finally here, it's just like the best feeling in the world. So I am so thrilled that you guys are here and that you've committed to writing your book. It's one thing that I can promise you, you will never regret doing. You will never regret spending the time and energy to write your book. Time passes too fast, right? We all know this. And your words, your story that you share, it's going to last far past your time here on earth, which is crazy to think about. But that's why if there's a story nudging you, that book idea that's nudging you, it's just probably why you're here right now. It's important for you to write it. Just stay true to yourself throughout the process and make sure you're taking the right steps to, to do it the right way. So you'll hear me talk a lot about the importance of writing and operating in this author journey from the soul. And that's just because our mind can take over way too often, right? And will make us doubt things or feel like we should do things a certain way because someone else is. But it's so important to take those moments and tune back into your original vision, what you truly want out of this journey and ensure that every decision you make along the way is authentic to that. All right, so let's take a moment to visualize your future book.
some of you may already know what your story idea is. But what do you see? What do you see when you think about holding your book someday? Which parts of it is the clearest so far? Is it the theme, the message, the story itself, the characters, the words, the readers who are holding it, the impact of your book, the book cover? Do you have a clear cover already in your head? Do you know where you want your book to be? What do you see when you visualize your future book? And likewise, maybe what do you see when you envision being an author? What does that look like for you? Are you looking at having these book signings at bookstores? Are you looking at um, traveling the world to do these book tours? Are you looking at collaborating with other organizations, having more speaking engagements, or simply just being on someone's bookshelf, which is pretty cool, right? To think about that someday. So what do you envision? And I want you to try to see as much of it as possible. For me, like when all my, all of my prior story ideas actually came from, um, from music. Like I would hear a song and then all of a sudden those lyrics would play out like a story in my head and that story would become my book. Like that story then would become my book. The story that I heard from the lyrics would become my book. So it was so easy for me to always visualize it. And if you like to doodle, doodle what that book looks like for you, because it's important to see that come to life. So the first thing that you want to do, if you haven't yet, is truly start out with your theme. Okay. So if you're lacking clarity in this, the best thing that I can recommend is starting with the end goal for the reader. What do you want that reader to walk away with when they read the very, very last word of your book? Do you want them to walk away with an emotion, a thought, a message to apply to their life, an action plan? Your book, no matter what you're writing, fiction or nonfiction, needs to fall under a theme of an overarching message. If you find that you cannot summarize the theme of your book in one easy to digest sentence, it's usually a sign that there's too much that you're trying to stuff into one concept. I see this over and over again with first time writers specifically. They have all of these book ideas that have been there, right? All of these concepts that they constantly think should go into a book. So then when they sit down to write their first book, they're trying to shove everything into that. What that's going to do is confuse the reader and muddy the impact of the book itself. So try to get it down to one very concise message of what your book is about. Is it to give parents the tools to uh, raise happy, healthy children? Is it to encourage someone who has been through, um, who's a combat vet, to look at growth afterwards, post-traumatic growth versus post-traumatic stress, like her book? Is it to help busy corporate moms balance parenting with their ambitious corporate dreams? What is your theme? What is the point of your book? And you can look at that as a message, a promise, the outcome that someone should achieve by reading your book. So let me tell you something if you are like struggling with like narrowing it down to one theme. More than likely, if you write this book, it's not going to be your only book, okay? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people are like, oh, I can't even think about writing one book right now, let alone multiple. It's kind of an addiction, okay? Once you realize that you can write a book, it makes it so much easier to write future books. So keep that in mind. Look at the idea that excites you the most. 
look at the one that you think you have the greatest chance of actually finishing the quickest. Because if you've already been struggling at writing a book, which one like really gets you fired up to complete this? Writing a book is hard. So you want to choose a topic or theme that can truly keep that momentum going for you. Then once you prove that you can indeed complete a book, it becomes easier. You can also look at which of your ideas, which of these themes are the hottest on the market right now. Is there a trend happening in that specific genre that you're looking at? Because this can also help you stay motivated to write the book faster before the market shifts again, right? Because it's always shifting. <laughs> There's always a new trend. So first goal always is to get clear in your theme, which is that guiding light for the rest of your book, because it will help you determine what belongs in your book and the direction that your book needs to go in. It's that end goal that you're working toward. So let's start with like the easiest question first. Do you want to write nonfiction or fiction? Then you dive in deeper from there. So what genre? If it's nonfiction, are you looking at thought le leadership, a memoir, self-help, inspirational book? If it's fiction, are you looking at mystery, romance, science fiction? If you're not sure, start with exploring books with similar concepts and see what genre those books are in. Genre is important because it's like the theme. It will help guide your book. It will help you with approaching certain storylines or points and how you want to market it, which, by the way, Marketing your book truly starts the moment that you decide you're going to write it. It starts with embracing the fact today that you are an author. You are an author of the story that you are about to write. So even if you have yet to write, you need to get comfortable with telling people that you're an author. You need to get comfortable showcasing that you are writing a book, right? Like sharing bits and pieces of your writing process. How are you finding that time to write? What does your setup look like when you are writing? Like, for example, I'm super inspired to write when suddenly it's raining outside. You've got that warm rain that's happening outside. And I love writing in those moments. So that's usually when I'll snap a picture of my setup of writing, usually in front of a window with that rain. And it's fun because it gets people interested. And in how are you writing this book? What is this book about? And they feel like they're a part of the process. So it's a great way to connect with readers early on. And it really helps generate excitement because they see that path, that journey that you're going on to write this book. And not only that, but you're probably going to inspire other people to write their book as well. Another question to consider is who is your target audience? I mean, you should know who you're writing to. Young adult language and scenarios will be diff quite different than an adult for a very specific reason, right? They're in a different place in their life than what adults are. If you're writing nonfiction specifically, I cannot stress this enough. You want a very specific person in mind. Who exactly are you trying to help or reach or transform or impact? And if you're motivated by visuals, print off a picture of someone who could fit that target reader. And not just anyone, I want you to think of someone that you have a personal, emotional tie to. And this can honestly work for fiction as well. But nonfiction specifically, I cannot stress this enough. When you have an emotional tie to that person, not only will it motivate you even more to write this book because you can think of the person who needs to read your book, you know that they need it for whatever they're going through in their life, but it also helps with that urgency aspect. And also when you have a clear target person in mind, your message, your delivery, it's going to be so much more clear and your tone will be on point. And it also makes it easier to embrace your actual voice because how do you feel comfortable presenting the information to them? Do you want it to come off more like a friendly conversation? Do you want it to come off more with an authoritative tone? Are you comfortable with blending in your natural sarcasm? All of those things allow you to own those bits more when you know specifically who you're writing for. And your confidence in your voice, don't expect, especially if this is your first time writing, don't expect for that confidence and that comfortable with like your specific author voice to be there from the beginning. It's truly shaped as you continue writing and you get into the flow. 
and you find that confidence then and the perspective, the approach, words, and ideas that are authentic to you, that make you you. I mean, a lot of us, for if we have favorite authors that we read time and time again, we could read random pages and know whether or not our favorite author wrote that book because we've learned their voice enough. So when you have a clear market in mind and even more so a very specific type of person, you'll be, at, you'll be amazed at how much easier that that can actually make the writing process. Because when you get stuck, then there are ways out of it, which we'll talk about more tomorrow <laughs> when we go through time management techniques. But taking the time to determine that market in advance is not something that enough writers do. And it's part of the reason why they get stuck because then they don't have that clarity in the direction of where they're headed because they have no clue what their theme is, which is the ultimate point of the book. And they also have no clue who they're talking to. So these are very important factors to get figured out now instead of waiting halfway through the writing process. And research is truly your friend. I mean, do not hesitate, you know, Take a look at the market that you're most interested in writing in. Evaluate the list of the top books in your genre. What are the popular themes, tropes, concepts that seem to be resonating with your target audience to get those at the top of the list? That's always super helpful. And a lot of times by researching, that helps us craft our ideas and know exactly what we want this book to be focused on. Reviews are a great way to see that too. You can see what people wish there was more of in certain books. And if that's something that lights you up, that resonates with you, take it and run with it. Being able to talk to your target readers in places like uh, discussion boards, like Reddit, it's a great way to find out what they're looking for and how you might be able to fill in a gap or how you might be able to provide more of what your target audience is looking for. So this is really what a big portion of why I would say sets Burning Soul Collective apart from other writing groups or writing services. Um, we put a lot of emphasis on how one of the most powerful ways that we can write a book is to take the time and deep dive into our own stories. I mean, if you are looking to become a storyteller and you're not sure how to begin, tell the story you know best, which is your own story. So it starts by writing on the stories that were significant impacts in our own life. Asking why, digging to the roots to discover the transformation of ourselves within those stories. <clears throat> Meaning, we know these significant events. What happened as a result of those significant events? Whether we were the ones that took action to make those events happen or whether those events happened to us. What broke us or forced us to identify or connect with the strength inside of us? What uncovered pieces of ourselves that we didn't know existed before these events happened, right? I mean, a lot of times that's what significant events in our lives do. They really showcase certain traits, elements of who we are that we didn't recognize before. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, but it's so important to really see that very specific tie and how those events led to some sort of transformation in you or your own life. It's important to identify the characters within our life that's played a significant role whether they're in your life for five minutes or 50 years. There's not really a qualification when it comes to time. Someone can impact your life just when they're crossing the street. Sometimes it's, you know, in a good way. Sometimes it's in a negative way. I always share this in all of my trainings, but it's just because something it's something that's really significant to me and has changed my life and has changed my writing. And uh, my favorite quote I ran across two years ago was, is, um, no man is a friend, no man is an enemy, every man is a teacher. And it's so true when you start looking at your life experiences and all of the people who you've encountered in your life as 
you know, if I just kind of neutralize it, kind of take out the emotion in a sense, what did I actually learn from this person and this event in my life? What did I learn from that and how did it change me? And when we're able to identify those, those bits and bring them into the stories that we share, that we tell, that's what connects with people on a deeper level, even if their minds aren't consciously aware of how that, that connection is being formed. Because that's human experience, right? And people can relate to that. They can relate to those stories. And because they can see them reflected in their own life. So you have so much material. If you have lived life at all, you have so much material there to work with. It's paying attention. It's observing. It's going back and really looking at all of the details that led to you feeling certain ways or what shifted your path, right? When something happened, why did you pivot this way instead of, you know, keep going straight? Or why did you take, turn left instead of right? Really analyzing everything that contributed to that. It's when we're able to really tap into those emotions, that's when we're able to get the most authentic stories out on, on paper because we're emotional beings, right? We can all experience completely different things in life, but what makes us connect with each other is how we feel and how we're able to relate to each other is based off those emotions. So if we don't think and uh, stop and think about why these people or situations impacted us, we can't reflect on the human experience. We can't showcase that in our own writing. Readers want to see who they are, pieces of who they are. They want to see their dreams or fears or other people they know reflected out in stories. It's what helps them connect with it. It's what helps these books truly become their favorite stories. And isn't it cool to write a book that has become someone's favorite book? <laughs> Like you could be someone's favorite author. And I think that's pretty incredible. So something else to look at is writing your book pitch. This is something that a lot of people will recommend doing after your book has been written already. I recommend doing it before you write your first word, because then you can improve it as you write. And then you can officially polish that pitch when you're done. What this does though, is serve as a guiding light, another guiding light. It really helps bring clarity to that theme of your book and what you're doing with it. So the pitch in itself, it's your story told in a single breath. <laughs> it's the first step to really getting people interested in your book. It's typically one to three sentences in length, in length and it just captivates people. It intrigues them. It will be what you use more than anything else. And the best thing you can do is memorize it, which is why it's important to have that one to three sentences. So memorize it because you'll use it all the time. You might even use it in your blurb. You might use bits of it for a tagline on the book cover. There are so many different ways you might be able to use it. So let's do an exercise with crafting your book. And you can work on this later. If you're still not sure about your theme, you can come back to this and work on it later. But I do have this broken out into, I'm gonna close out one of my programs here so the noise stops. Um, so I have it broken down to fiction and nonfiction, just because you might be looking at writing nonfiction right now, but I write both. <laughs> I write fiction and nonfiction. Again, it's addicting, right? And you might just find a different flow as you go through life and write more and more. Um, and then I've also had clients who started off thinking they want to write fiction. And then what they discovered through the fiction process is that, no, they actually love writing nonfiction. So it's important. I want to present you with all the information just in case there's a swap in your interests. Um, okay. So here are the questions that you can ask yourself to help develop the pitch. So for fiction, what makes your protagonist interesting? The hero of your story, right? 
what are the most important things at stake in your story? Just so you know, every hero and every story, they are driven by something that's a part of their internal motivation and they're driven by what's at stake. And usually some sort of urgency that's progressing them to move faster and to move forward within the book. And then what is that main conflict, that central conflict that's, you know, get standing in their way of reaching their goal, reaching their obstacle from fulfilling their mission? When you're able to link these three things into a pitch, it makes it very captivating. I'm going to give you a tip too here in a bit for how to make this easier or how to get some great examples to work off. All right, so for nonfiction, what is your main theme or problem you're solving? Or what is that transformation that you are wanting a reader to experience? It's really the promise of your book. Like by reading this book, you're going to X, Y, Z. <laughs> like what I said earlier with, I always use um, like the Brave Parent book here. What do you need to do? What are the tools to help you raise healthy, happy kids against all odds in today's world? Why are you the right person to write this book? What makes you qualified? And it has to be more than just the fact that you lived, you lived this. I mean, yes, experience is key. It helps you bring in those stories that connect with the reader, but there has to be something else about it. Like maybe there's something unique about the framework that you develop that's going to help people. What, why are you the right person to write this book? Why should they read this topic? from you versus someone else. And then likewise, what is your twist on the topic? What is your unique framework that's really going to be effective or help people even more or connect with them on a deeper level? So tips for how to craft a captivating pitch. If fiction showcase the primary conflict in your book, that's the intrigue, right? It's the excitement. It gets people hooked. Use accurate, concise descriptives that make your character interesting because people want to be able to connect and bond with that main character in some way. So for example, maybe they're, um, you know, having a midlife crisis at 35. <laughs> you know, use that to describe your character. Uh, for nonfiction, it should state what problem your book is solving and the unique approach perspective that qualifies you as the writer. It captures what makes your book unique. It should be one, one sentence is best. Again, you want to make sure it's easily memorable, easy to be memorized by you. Um, and also even better if someone else can ver can say that same pitch back to you after they've heard it once. I mean, then that's strong, right? Then they can tell all their friends about it. Um, and you want to make sure that it evokes emotions because we're emotional creatures and that is how we are drawn to certain things. So are you ready for my secret tip? <laughs> I scroll through Netflix or imdb.com. If you've never been to imdb.com, it's really just a database of basically every movie or TV show that's ever existed, the actors who are all involved. And um, what's great is that they give very concise pitches on what every TV show and um, movie is all about. And it's very concise to the point, sets up the intrigue, sets up what the book is all, or what the movie is all about. Y'all, if you need inspiration, that is the best database for inspiration. So here are some examples from it. The survivors of a plane crash are forced to work together in order to survive on a seemingly deserted tropical island. Anyone know what that one is? So that's for Lost. A thief who steals corporate secrets through the use of dream sharing technology is given the inverse task of planting an idea into the mind of a CEO. That's Inception. Um, here are some for documentaries. So if you are writing a memoir and you're looking for how do I find a pitch motivation for a memoir, look at documentaries. Those are huge. Um, for example, this is from 13th, an in-depth look at the prison system in the United States and how it reveals the nation's history of racial inequality. 
that's not right. <laughs> well, and then this one's from Super Size Me. While examining the influence of the fast food industry, Morgan Spurlock personally explores the consequences consequences on his health of a diet of solely McDonald's food for one month. It could be very similar to your nonfiction book. Okay. So these are really, really helpful, helpful pitches to, to review when you're looking at crafting your own. So let's look at plotting your book now. Okay, let's get structure in place. Hopefully now you have a theme, you know the direction of your book, that angle, you have the target reader in mind. So maybe you've heard of the ultimate debate. Are you a pantser or a plotter? Just to clarify those, a pantser lets the story develop as they write each word. They may have a general direction of the story in mind, but they don't write out the details before they start writing. They just kind of go in there and just start hammering out the words. Whereas a plotter plans out the story in advance and they usually have a detailed, orient, a detailed outline that they're working off of. So they spend a lot of time in the pre-planning before they actually start writing. There are pros and cons to both sides, right? As everything in life. But it does make a difference to know which one is kind of your default way of operating. So that way you can address it if you feel like it's not producing the results that you want it to produce. And what I mean by this is that I, by nature, am a pantser. I like just getting in there and writing and flying by the seat of my pants and, you know, whatever comes out of my mind is there. The con to this, the pro to this is it can be fun <laughs> because I just let the characters guide me. I let the story go wherever it wants. However I'm feeling that day, that's what I write about. The con to this is that it's very easy to get off track. It's very easy to go into a different direction that I did not originally want the story to go in. It's very complicated when you go back to edit it and you're like, oh, why did I do this and this and this? This doesn't really add up. There's a risk for plot holes, for character arc holes, um, because things weren't carefully planned and plotted out in the very beginning. On the flip side, being a plotter, you have that, that plan, right? It's the structured plan. The con that you have to watch out with being a plotter is that sometimes they get so set in following this plan, it doesn't allow for extra room and creativity when the inspiration, when the muse strikes. Y'all, one of the things that I'm the most passionate about is that every single day that we live life, we have the opportunity to become a better writer because writers are observant of the world around them. And every day we're encountering new people, new situations, new things in nature that's happening. And if we pay attention, we have brand new material that we can bring into our book. When you're in the middle of writing, you could have the opportunity to learn something based off of what's happening around you, political climate change, whatever it is that could fuel your book and make it even better than what you originally intended it to be. So sometimes the con with plotting is that they get so set on having a very specific structure that they are scared to death to make changes to that when they're already in the flow of the book. So it's really important to be aware of the pros and cons of being a plotter and being a planner uh, or a pantser versus a plotter. Now, like I said, by nature, I am a pantser. What happened by being a pantser is that I was continually waiting for that inspiration to strike, right? I had to be in the mood to write before I could let all the words just flow out of me. If I had a busy day, if I was stressed, like it was just not a good day to write, so I never got it done. If I had more direction, my first book shouldn't have taken me 10 years to write. But it did because I did not have a clear plan in place. And this is a clear plan with not only where my book is going, that structure of it, but also a clear plan and how I'm going to tackle it 
by my goals and my time management, which again are all things we'll talk about tomorrow. My first book took me 10 years to write. My second book took me 30 days to write. Same number of words, 85,000 words for both. But the difference is that I went from being a panter to forcing myself to be a plotter because I knew I wanted to complete that second book in this limited time that I had available. Neither one's wrong. And you can be both. You don't just have to keep yourself in a box as a pantser or a plotter. You can truly pull out the, the pros, the perks, <laughs> and use them to your advantage of both, okay? So don't lock yourself in a box, but it is good to know what you naturally gravitate to so you can be aware of any pitfalls associated with that as well. All right, let's talk about structures. There are a lot of different book structures out there that you can choose from. For example, the three-act structure, seven-point story structure, classic story structure, the hero's journey, a disturbance in two doorways, and y'all, there are many, many others. This is kind of a blurred graphic. I'm sorry for that. But the one that is used the most with fiction and nonfiction, because it is the easiest to understand and grasp, has been the three-act structure, which is why I have more of a... a um, breakdown of it here. Because for a lot of beginner writers, specifically, the three-act structure is the easiest one to get their mind wrapped around and to really be able to see how their, their story best breaks down. And when you understand this model, you'll see it in so many of the books that you read as well. So the, the basic if we're just looking at the three act structure, is there's a beginning, middle, and end. <laughs> Y'all, this is the secret to storytelling. Even if you are writing a nonfiction book, say an inspirational book, and you're weaving in personal stories within those main points that you're structuring in your book, and we'll talk about that here in a bit, when you are sharing your stories, little clips of your stories throughout, you always want to make sure that there's a beginning, middle, and end. Many people don't realize that <laughs> they'll start to like go into one direction and then they'll never complete it. And then the point was missed as a result. So when you're looking at the three act structure specifically, act one is like your chance to introduce your protagonist, the hero of your story. Keep in mind, okay, this is fiction based with the way I'm talking about it, but it can also be used for your memoir because you are the main character in your memoir. And a lot of people struggle with looking at it that way but you are, you're the, you're the hero of your journey in your memoir. You're the hero of your journey in your life. So act one is your chance to introduce the protagonist. It's setting up the way of their life before things significantly change while also setting up the shift that is about to ensue, right? Like what this whole book is about. And it includes that inciting incident, which is what changes things before it kicks off the rising action events, right? So I always call it that one of those points in a life when you know that your life will never be the same. Like something happened that kicks off everything else that's about to happen, that's about to occur, the theme of your book, the theme of your life. And in hindsight, you're able to go back and identify that inciting incident as being, wow, if that didn't happen, not sure that all of those events afterwards would have happened either. Um, this is the Parakeet Drawing. It's a book that I had the opportunity to be able to co-author for Gina. And um, for example, you know, with this book, it's, it's I mean, it's, it's a powerful memoir about her life and how she was affected by an alcoholic and mother who neglected her and exposed her to you know, um, sexual abuse and some other things that happened throughout. And so the inciting incident was when her parents got divorced and then her mom got together with this guy who ended up being a big negative part of Gina's life. Before that, her life would have been different. But that was the inciting incident that kicked off all of these other rising action events that led to the climax. So then act two is about the rising events, the things that get worse before they get better. It's more being put on the line. Stakes are raising 
there's opposition with the antagonists. Things are happening. There's tension with other characters, but there is growth in the main character throughout. There's also a display of their strengths. There's a display of their weaknesses, their inner demons, the battles that they're facing. That's why act two is so much longer. Yeah, it's a three act structure, but it's not 33, 33, 33, right? Like act two is a big percentage of the story because there's a lot that's taking place and is being revealed within the character as those events happen. And then act three usually has the climax. It's that breaking point of your character. Uh, one myth with climaxes is that people always think it has to be like some big event, like a battle that happens. And that's not the case. Many times it can be this quiet revelation, but what it is is their life will truly never be the same after they reach this point. There's no going back after a certain event, after a certain revelation, whatever it may be. So usually, you know, it could be like facing a fear, overcoming a big obstacle, becoming their new self. And then you have those following action events. So it's being lowered kind of from that high to reach the conclusion of the book. So there are many ways you can approach this, but no matter what, I just, when you look at your structures, now that you have a clear idea of who your target reader is, you got to remember what you're creating here is an experience for the reader. You're taking them through a journey in your book. So there are a lot of layers and things that need to be included in that like going back to the human experiences and making sure those are built in there, looking at what's at stake, the urgency, those changes within the character as they go through this journey, all of those elements need to be in there, okay? This is something that in the Soulful Author Journey Program, we dive into so much more because it, it gets layered. <laughs> and you really have to be careful with this because this is the meat of your book. So I promised you we'd go into nonfiction a little bit. So nonfiction, I say non-memoir because most memoir books are written like a fiction book in a lot of ways. You're using the same structures as a fiction book, a lot of the same methods and techniques as a fiction book. So even though memoirs are nonfiction books as a category because they're based on real life, they are written very similarly to a um, fiction book. Some of them are, most of them are. Um, so if you're looking at writing more of a nonfiction book, so like a self-help, thought leadership, uh, inspirational book, you're going to use this A to Z method. And what it is, again, is you're looking at the end point first, right? I always recommend that. Start with where do you want the reader to end up when they read that last page of your book? What should they be taking away? What should they know? What's that final point? And then you're working backwards. You're looking at then how are they starting? Where are they at in the very beginning of this? And if you know your target audience, well, you're going to know where they're at today and where they need to go. So then you have all of those points in between, those main points that you want to share with them. And it's almost like you're giving them those tools, right, to help them along in their journey. And then when you're looking at this, the introduction, the point one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you're also looking at Okay, what are the subpoints that need to be included in this? And not only that, but what are the stories, whether it's personal stories of yours or brought in as like examples of clients that you've worked with or other people that, that you've had in your life, you want to bring in stories to really bring those points to life, to connect them with the reader, because you can give someone all of this information, right? Like just give them all the facts all the, all the education they need. But if you give them a story that's showcasing those facts, showcasing the information where they're able to create that emotional connection with the story you tell, maybe they're able to see pieces of who they are in that story. Guess what they're going to remember the most? Guess what they're going to be impacted by the most? And so it's so important to look at if you have a structure like this, yes, you have your very clear points that all relate to that overarching theme, 
but that you also have the story supporting each of those points that are relatable to your target audience. So no matter, and I've said this a few times already, but I just want to drive it home today, no matter if you're writing fiction or nonfiction, the one question I challenge writers to think about throughout is what is at stake? What's at stake for the characters or the world within your fiction story? What's at stake if someone doesn't get the help that they need in your book or have their mind opened by the learning that you're presenting? The world is full of stakes. And when we know there's something at risk, something at stake, our emotions are tapped into and it keeps the reader intrigued to keep turning the pages. There's a lot more to this to consider. And again, something we, we dive in deeper with the soul author journey because there are so many layers, but it's a big one. I want you to always keep it in mind. If there's nothing at stake within your book, what's, what's the purpose? What's the purpose? Why is it going to intrigue somebody to keep reading? How's it going to connect with them? against the reflection of real life. So I talked about earlier about, you know, embracing what works for your mind and not using the same methods as everyone else. And some of us simply work better with more of that freedom, right? As much as overwhelming as a blank page can be when we sit down to actually type our story or write our story, sometimes a blank page can be very liberating when we're looking at getting all of these ideas down into some sort of structure that we can work with within our book. So here are a few different techniques that have really worked for clients of all types, <laughs> whether you have more of that like creative, chaotic mind like I do, or whether you like more of the structure and the details, these have been extremely effective for clients across the board. Okay, so you have the mind mapping, the brain dumping, the brainstorming. Mind mapping is really when you when you start with, you know, a central concept, like I would recommend, for example, starting with your theme, okay? And then you're taking all of these elements of your theme and drawing lines out, right, to other things connected to them. So let me give you an example of like one of my fiction books. Um, so the theme I knew was a world without feelings. So I drew that on a piece of paper, world without feelings, put a circle around it. And then I did a line out and I was like, okay, so who is my main character? And I knew it was Evang Evangeline. And I had little bubbles out from there. She's turning 18. She doesn't know what else exists in the world. She was raised in this very, you know, uh, per, uh, utopian society. Um, I had another character drawn out from there, Gavin who lives on the outskirts. He plays What If You Could Feel games with Evangeline. Um, he's a reflection of this time of the before. I had another one drawn out from the theme about the location. So I knew it was going to be in Pietus, the only surviving community after the before. And then I had another arrow, uh, line drawn out with what is the before? What was this time that everyone keeps referencing? You know, it's a destroyed destruction, wars of the past, land shrunk, diseases, et cetera. Okay, so then if I'm looking at nonfiction, I'm doing the same thing with what is this book actually about? Well, I, I want this book to be how can first time writers write and publish their book? Okay, so that's the theme and I'm gonna draw out every element of it. So I'm gonna have one bubble for planning, one for goal setting, one for writing, one for revising, one for publishing, one for promoting. And then from those bubbles, I'm gonna have all of the little sub points outside of that. So that essentially is mind mapping. Uh, brain dumping is literally when you're taking like everything you know up here and putting it on a piece of paper as fast as you can possibly do it. Y'all, when you are looking at, you know, I really want to bring in my life stories. How can I weave that into the message that I want to share with people? Brain dumping is huge for that because I'm always like, just set a timer and all of those significant events in your life, write them down, right? I mean, just like little high level topics about what they're about. So you can capture them and you can go back and you know what, you know what they're referencing. Uh, brain dumping is powerful because sometimes too, when you're just setting this timer and you're like, I'm not going to think about anything else except what's up here and getting it down on paper. You pull out things that have cobwebs on them, right? That you shoved way back in your mind years ago and you forgot about, and it can be a very effective technique for that reason. And then brainstorming, 
one of my favorites. <laughs> I always joke and say brainstorming is one of my favorite hobbies. It is so powerful when you can connect with someone else. And this is why I promote like crazy. Um, having a community of other writers who get what you're trying to do around you and having the people who are willing to brainstorm with you because they have different experiences and perspectives than you do. So if they know your theme, if they know your objective, exactly what you're trying to deliver to your target audience, they're able to bring in so much more that you didn't previously think about. And those sessions are a blast. I mean, get like a whiteboard or if you're on a Zoom call, Zoom has whiteboards now that you can access virtually and just start documenting and brainstorming with each other. It's so, so powerful. And again, that's part of what we created with the Soulful Author Journey is that community aspect with the book coaches so you can brainstorm together. Other techniques, I love these things. Uh, number one, note cards. You know, Write down all of your ideas, everything that you wanna share, everything that you think you could share in a book on note cards. Have each note card be a separate topic, main topic, and then just start, filling those out, right? Throwing them on the ground. And then you can go back and add in details for those main topics. And it will also allow you to select which ones should go into your book and which ones fall outside the theme and can be saved for your future book. Because y'all, like I said, there's always going to be more than one book, I guarantee you. <laughs> um, so note cards are great for that. And for those who like more of that tangible uh, element, like it just helps really make those ideas more concrete. It helps make the process feel more concrete. Note cards are powerful for that reason. Um, I also use note cards for fiction books, honestly, um, in the terms of like, I'll stand up and I'll be like, okay, this is where the character is. Like the character is in this situation currently, put the note card down fill out a note card with where I want that character to be, put it across the other end of the room. And it's putting myself visually into the situation. If I was this character stuck in the situation right now, what do I need to do to make my way to that other note card? Like it's this physical activity, right? Really putting yourself in the scene to help you see what's needed and to make you more aware of any sort of gaps that are there. It's almost like virtual reality without the virtual reality part. Um, so post-it notes, this is another great way. I mean, uh, I have authors who will just chart out their entire book on note cards and they'll do them with color-coded methods. So they know exactly like what falls into certain points or themes or, um, you know, what are stories versus what are the main points, what are the sub points. So whatever works for you, that's a very uh, organized method that my brain has a hard time <laughs> connecting with. But if you're organized, it's a great method because it helps them have that visual layout on their wall as well. Uh, printing off images, really great with fiction books specifically. Um, if you're looking at, or even memoirs, because we did this with like Gina's book, we had to go back and look at, you know, what did 1970s in Utah look like? Um, so we went back and did a lot of research and printed that off and it allowed us to bring that scene into the book because then you, you have those pictures in front of you that you can then describe because what you're trying to do is bring the reader into that same world, right? So you want to make sure that you're able to describe it in a way that makes them feel like they are there. Um, another cool point on this, I mean, if you're looking at how do I go back and describe like a certain period of time or a certain city or street or something like that. It's a, it's not Google Maps, but it's like Google Street View, I think is what it's called. Um, it's incredible because we did the same thing again for Gina's book specifically. We went back and did the street view for the old street that she grew up on. And it was so cool because she was like, oh yeah, the bar and, you know, the dumpsters behind that bar or that house. And it just helped so much more when we were recreating specific scenes. So a little note there. Um, using an illustrator is another great way if you like those visual representations of like characters, for example, that you're creating or worlds, if you're building your own world. There are a lot of great illustrators um, that you can find even just looking on Instagram who help authors bring their the vision of their characters to life. And there are several authors that I work with who will have their fictional characters drawn up by an illustrator 
because it just helps them bring those characters to life even more as they're writing out their book. And then Scrivener is a great program that I would recommend downloading. Uh, Scrivener is really great at helping you keep track of all of your notes, everything that you want to include in your book. Um, it helps you um, keep track of any research that you're doing. So that way you have any references that you have to go back to later and document. They're all there. I love Scrivener. I, I keep everything in there. Poetry, fiction, nonfiction. Um, it's just a really great tool to be able to, to organize my thoughts as I sh finally shape it into a book. So, and you can have multiple projects in there. We also have free outlines in those modules or in the From Blank Pages to a Writing Machine module. So be sure to check that out. I believe it's in the introduction module. Um, those, are, those are available to you. So take full advantage. Uh, one is nonfiction and then one is fiction. Again, if you're writing memoir, I would recommend that you use the fiction one and not the nonfiction one. So let's talk about your homework for today. You guys, the whole point of a workshop is to be able to take those action steps so you can make progress on your book. And that's why I want for you more than anything else from this entire workshop. I want you to feel like you have made progress. So number one is clarifying your message or your theme of your book. So try to get it down to that one simple, simple sentence that signifies what you hope your reader walks away with when they finish the last word. I know I talked a lot about like impact and inspiration and empowerment, but y'all it's even, you know, if you want them to simply be entertained and have your book as an escape or give them hope of love or whatever it is, whatever that, whatever your point is, whatever is getting you excited about writing this book. I mean, write that down, make it very, very clear because it is ultimately the heart and soul of your book. It's that one consistent element that you want every reader to be able to take away. Uh, research books that are similar to yours to understand the genre they're in. Um, so if you feel like, like a lot of authors I work with, will be like, well, I really love like books by Brene Brown or, you know, Glennon Doyle. And, um, but I don't, I, I don't really know where to start. If you don't know, but you, you feel like those are the types of books you want to write, research, take a look at the market, take a look at what made them so love. Same thing with fiction books. Look at what the elements are that your potential story could have that are similar or those that are different. When you know your market that you're in, it makes you a better advocate for the story that you're writing. That's why I say it's so important to do this early on and not enough authors do it. The more you know about your market, the better your book will be. The one thing I want to caution with this is make sure though that you're not trying to necessarily write like someone else that you admire. It should still feel authentic to you. And one of the ways I always say to check this, to check if it feels like it's truly your voice and not just trying to mimic someone else's voice, try reading your words out loud. Think of it as though if your book was published and then you were the narrator of the audiobook. Does it sound authentic and genuine to you? Or do you feel like you're stumbling over the words because it's not the way you would typically speak or it's not the way you would typically approach things? So that's just a good gauge for you. Um, start working on your pitch. Those you know, one to three sentences for why someone should read your book. Use the questions we discussed as a template. Also take a look at Netflix or IMDb. Look at the way that they've described all of those movies or TV shows in one powerful line that intrigues the reader. And again, if you're looking at writing a memoir specifically, take a look at documentaries because that'll help you. Play around with mind mapping or brain dumping or brainstorming for that matter to start plotting out your ideas. Truly turn off all distractions, silence your phone, disconnect from Wi-Fi, whatever it takes. Set a timer for 20 minutes and just let your brain go haywire. There's something beautiful that happens when we allow ourselves the time and the space to let that true flow from within come out. Don't second guess what you're writing. Don't let that imposter syndrome kick in yet. <laughs> just write. Remember, you can always revise it later. So this is something you'll hear me say over and over again. Always write for you first. No one else is seeing what you're writing unless you share it, right? But this is between you and the pages. 
right for you first before you start second guessing what anyone else is going to think or say about what you're writing, okay? All of that can be changed, revised later. For now, just write for you. And then finally, embrace this journey. Like I said, you're already an author if you're writing the story, the book idea on your, on your heart. You're an author. That's what an author does. They write. They write books. So your creative path to get there, to have a published book, may be different than another person's. Trust your unique talents your unique creative abilities. Turn off your brain and let the story flow from your heart, okay? You are fully capable of writing this book. This isn't just a whim or a random idea that landed on you. There's a reason. There's a reason for it. And the cool thing about books is right now, I know you're focused on like writing a book, but there's a greater reason behind it. There are readers who need your book as well. And I am a big advocate for that. All right. So if you have any questions, please always put them in the Q&A. Thank you for joining me today. I know we went a little bit over the hour, but tomorrow we will be going into goals and time management to help you take your plots, your structure, your planning from today and put it into a timeline, an actual action plan so that you can write and finish this book and have the right methods in place to bring it to life. And again, be sure to tap into the workbook and the nonfiction and fiction outlines in the module. And I will see you all tomorrow.